Hey, I want to start a brand new series with you today uh, called Rebuild the Walls. And I want to talk to you out of the book of Nehemiah. And uh, Nehemiah is a really interesting character in the Bible, a real interesting book to study. Nehemiah actually has incredible leadership lessons all throughout the book. But I, I want to focus on really what was the passion of Nehemiah's heart, and it was to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem had been under siege. It had gone into captivity. The walls had been decimated. The people were in bondage. And, and Nehemiah feels this call to go back into the city and to rebuild what has been broken. I want you to go in your Bibles, if you have them, to Nehemiah chapter 2. We'll have it on the screen as well. It says, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, it's a hard name to say, you got to say it really fast and nobody even noticed, but I kind of I stumbled on it. Like, is that how you say that? Don't worry about it. <laughs> when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad and sad when you are not ill? This could be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it that you want? And then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah. Let him send me, everybody say send me. Let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I, it's really key, so that I can rebuild it. Nehemiah in this passage of scripture, he is broken hearted because of the condition of the city that he came from. Jerusalem was known as the city of God. It was, it was known as God's city. God's people lived in God's city and it had been taken into captivity. The walls had been, uh, are now in ruins. Nehemiah chapter 1 had got word that the people were in disgrace and he doesn't know what to do with his feelings. He, he, he doesn't know what to do with this news and he goes to the king and says, I need to go back. Will you send me so that I can rebuild the walls? I, I, I want you to know this is that you are, have been designed and created with a specific purpose in mind. A part of your life is discovering why God has you on this planet. Part of your life is the quest to really find out why am I here? What am I, what am I doing here? And God has something for you. God has something constructed for you that fits your personality, your life, your passions, your burdens perfectly. And, and, and Nehemiah, he became brokenhearted because of the condition of the people. And the king said this. He said, I've never seen you sad before in my presence. Nehemiah said, how could I not be sad when the people that I love, the city that I love, are in ruins? He, he said, it must be sadness of heart. I think it's hard in life to just process sadness. Because brokenness happens to everybody. Sadness happens to everybody. I I'm trying to teach my boys like how to deal with their emotions in a healthy way. And um, sometimes I can, well not sometimes, all the time I have a difficult time making food for myself. So I have to budget for my problems. And uh, so I have to budget around this. And, and we, I was watching the boys and we didn't eat lunch and it was getting later. And, and Genesis, my youngest son, was just like going crazy. And it's like just cranky and he's just mad and everything. And I'm like, but Genesis, what is going on? And he goes, I think I'm, I think I'm hangry. <laughs> Hungry and angry together. And I'm like, Genesis, that's amazing. You just identified your emotion. You're not just mad. You're mad because you didn't eat. We got to get you a snack. And so we got him a snack and he, he's good. We, we play this game. I don't know if we got any parents out there, but your kids, I don't know if you experienced this, but they talk to everybody else more than they talk to you. My boys are only seven and eight, and they'll be talking to other people. I'm like, what happened? What did that kid do at school? Like, I want to, so I designed a game to collect data. It's called emotions. You guys can play with your kids if you want. It's called emotions. It's fun. I just throw out an emotion, disappointed, and they got to tell me a story in that day or that week where they were disappointed. Happy. They got to tell me something, and they love it. Man, it's a game. So they're telling me all kinds, I'm learning all kinds of stuff. Then I, then I throw out the kicker, you know, angry. 
Oh, yeah, this kid at school. I'm like, oh, that's what I was looking for. Give me the, give me the, give me the tea. Give me the data. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get this out of you. But I'm teaching them how to process emotion because every person will experience disappointment and brokenness. This is what's happened in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is experiencing brokenness because of the condition or the state of his people and his city. He's trying to put together what I'm going to do with the brokenness that I feel. God burdened Nehemiah's heart because Nehemiah had the opportunity and he had the capability of doing the very thing which God had called him to do. I want you to know this. We live in a time where our culture is in ruins. We have families that are in ruins. We have marriages that are in ruins. Our education system is in ruins. Some of our churches are in ruins. Some of our mental space is in ruins. Some of our hearts and our emotions are in ruins. We have broken places, and I want you to know this, that broken places are an opportunity and an invitation for God to come in and do something supernatural. I want you to know something about your God. Our God doesn't do anything halfway. God's not a halfway God, a somewhat God, or just get it halfway done, halfway accomplished. God starts things and he finishes things. So if God started something in your life, this is good news, God's not going to leave it like it is. I, I, I can be really good at starting projects. Anybody else? Like starting the project, but like finishing the project. I get real passionate about it. Like, let's do it. We're going to remodel the whole house. You know, then you tear up the floor and you're like, oh, man, call somebody quick. Like we're, we're in trouble because we're good at starting, but it's difficult to follow through. It's difficult to follow. But, but God wants, I believe this, is God wants to release a burden to the people of God to rebuild the places that have been broken. That there is a specific anointing that's on your life, that's on your family, to rebuild broken places. And I know what you're saying. I'm not called the ministry pastor. It, Nehemiah wasn't called the ministry. Nehemiah was the cupbearer of the king. He worked in a, in a kingdom, in a political office. You know what the cupbearer was? The cupbearer tasted the wine and the food before the king ate it to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. Imagine that job. So, I mean, like every day you're just on pins and needles. <laughs> like, I mean, you're about to drink that, drink that wine. It's like, oh, this could be the last one. It'd be a perfect opportunity to play a prank and just take a drink and just out. <laughs> King's like, my gosh, someone tried to kill me. Like, no, we're good, we're good. It's just joking, king. It's on you. He, this, this was his job. He was a cupbearer. This is, this is, he wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't someone that was, was, was different than everybody else or more gifted or more anointed. In fact, Nehemiah wasn't even a builder. But he was someone that had a burden. And when he had a burden for what was broken, God said, I'm going to anoint you to rebuild what has been torn down. And I believe this, that God's raising up people in our body and in our community and in our church that carry the burden of God, that are not content just to say, uh, it's broken. But the brokenness is an invitation for the people of God to step in to the burden of God. And the burden of God is what causes us to rebuild what has been broken. Do you know the church is created not to be a place, a safe place from the world? The church was designed to equip us to go rebuild what has been broken. The, the, the church is supposed to be the place where we get equipped and trained to go out and to rebuild the walls that have been destroyed, the walls of family, the walls of relationship. A burden develops out of brokenness. How do you get a burden? A burden develops out of brokenness. You know that God never wastes a season? God never wastes a crisis. God never wastes a season of pain. God will always use what the enemy meant for evil, and he will work it for your good. So how do you get a burden? You get a burden because it's developed out of a place of brokenness. You can look back at your life, and you can probably see this. Whenever there is brokenness, you have an opportunity to, A, get bitter, or B, get burdened. 
When you bring your brokenness before God, it develops into a burden. If you bring your bro- brokenness into your bedroom and you start thinking about how broken things are, how bad things are, you end up getting mad at God. Brokenness that turns into bitterness says, God, why? Brokenness that turns into burden says, Lord, send me. There is a big difference. Everybody encounters brokenness, but what you do in the broken seasons of your life determine what God does with the burden of your heart. Nehemiah chapter 1, this is where Nehemiah gets the news about his people. Chapter 1, verse 3, it says, They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble. This is his people. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned, and I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. Now listen to this. When he heard of the walls that were broken, it caused him to weep. I just want to ask you this question. When was the last time you wept over brokenness? When was the last time we wept over people that are lost? When was the last time we wept over a city? I know we've been broken and we've gotten bitter. Oh, I can't believe our government. Yeah, you're, you're broken. But have you taken the brokenness into the presence of God? And allowed it to become a burden? I can't believe those churches. I can't believe this person. I can't, I can't. Have you taken that, that brokenness into the... This is what Nehemiah did. He says he was brokenhearted. He was saddened. And he fasted and prayed. Okay, let me ask you a question that the other services did not do so well on, okay? When was the last time you took a, a moment of brokenness and prayed and fasted about it before you posted about it? Yeah, they did, they did the same thing. It was, it was rough, rough. For most of us, never. Oh, yeah, that makes me mad. We send it out. Have you ever allowed God to develop burden in you? Burden doesn't happen in a moment. Burden happens when you take brokenness and you give it to God. He fasted and prayed, and as he took his brokenness into the presence of God, burden was beginning to be developed in him. He said, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to rebuild. Lord, send me. Brokenness can turn to bitterness or burden, depending on where you take it. A burden develops out of brokenness. A burden drives you to God. See, this, this thing is, most people think they have a burden, but they could, they could alleviate the burden themselves. Uh, if you're hungry, get out of here and go get lunch, and you're going to feel better. Right? You, you don't need God for that. It's not big enough. A burden is something that's so big that only God can do it. Do you, know, you know how we've planted this church, grown this church, developed this church? is by burden. You know why we went to Oak Cliff? Because of the burden of the Lord. People said we couldn't do it. People said we shouldn't do it. People said we couldn't afford it. No one would come. It would fail. And guess what? We had a burden from the Lord. We're not following strategies, get rich quick ideas, grow the church fast in seven steps. We're following the burden of the Lord. Why did we buy a building in Frisco and start a location in Frisco? Not just because Frisco's Frisco, but because we had burden. The burden of the Lord. You know, so many people say it's not a good time to buy a building right after a pandemic. It's crazy. Everything's uncertain. Everything's hot. Well, God provided a miracle building for us in Frisco, and nobody said we could do it, and nobody said it would happen, and it did because we followed burden. A burden develops out of brokenness, but a burden drives you to God because it can only be accomplished by God. What are you believing God for that's so big? That he has to come through for you or you will fail. That's where I like to live my life. It's exciting out there. It's scary out there. Keeps you on your toes. I want to live in a place of faith so far out. I almost went down right there. (laughs) God, so far in faith that if God doesn't come through, then I'm done. I want to live in a place where I am carrying the burden of heaven and the burden of God. That says, God, lead me to the broken places. Lead me to the broken people. I want this burden to require your power. Many of us, we don't need God's power. Because we've never done something big enough or stepped out in faith enough to require it. A true burden from God will require supernatural intervention. 
Bitterness will always drive you away from God. Burden will always drive you to God. Burden will drive you to God. A burden drives you to God. A burden demands action. You know, I talk to a lot of people that, that they're broken about the things in our world, culture. They're broken and they stay broken and they become bitter. Then there's some people that they're broken and they take it to the Lord and they become burdened, but they stay burdened. So their whole life they're just sad. Just sad. This is a lot of churches. You walk in, it's like, why is everybody so sad? Like, why? I saw you at the game. You all look good. But you come into church and you look sad because we carry a burden and we have not. The Bible says this. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The church should be the most exciting, celebratory, joy-filled place that you ever walk into. It should be full of the spirit of God. It should be full of the presence of God. We should hear the voice of God. It shouldn't be a checkoff list for us. I'm telling you, when you begin to live under the burden of God, it will drive you to action. Why do you start the business? Because you have a burden from the Lord. Why do you step out in faith? Because you have a burden from the Lord. Why are you teaching that class? Because you have a burden for the Lord. And if you begin to follow the burden then you require his supernatural power. The burden of God demands action. It demands a step of faith. A true burden cannot be lifted until action is taken. You know, we have a burden for the next generation. You know, I, 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 told, I told Frisco this, I'm sure it's not going to be like this in Allen, but I told Frisco, the people that walk into church in Frisco and say, man, there's too many young people here, don't have a, they don't understand burden. We're not trying to build a young church, but we have a burden for the next generation. So instead of critiquing, you should be celebrating what God is doing. People, I think we've got the wrong idea that church is just supposed to be for me. So we come into church and we think like, this is all about me. And I don't know, you know, just so you know, pastor, uh, the temperature was a little, little cold for me. My preference is, your preference? What? What? Like, I, hey, uh, the, the seats are a little bit hard in, in Frisco. I'd like a little softer seat. What? This is not about our preference. This, this is about worshiping, exalting, and rebuilding the walls of a city that has been broke down and devastated. Our call, our burden is not about full buildings or lots of campuses. Our call and our burden is for city transformation from the youngest of the young to the oldest of the old. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to have a church where people just check off the box but they never encounter God. We can gather and talk about the Bible and talk about good principles, but if you never encounter the presence of God, what are we doing? We gather to worship Him. We gather to be equipped by Him. We gather so He can take our beauty or our ashes and give us beauty, our brokenness and give us burden. The burden of the Lord. The burden of the Lord. I go to conferences all the time, speak at different conferences. Everybody's got the newest tips and tricks on how to reach people, how to disciple, how to grow. And you know what I just found? I found like all of that is important. I love all that and it helps me and we use some of it. But for me, I got to follow the burden of the Lord. I've got to give my, listen, for you, you've got to follow the burden of the Lord. You've got to give yourself to the burden of the Lord. What irritates you? You might be part of the solution. You know what Nehemiah said? He said, Lord, send me. I will rebuild the vault. The crazy thing is Nehemiah was not a builder. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. I'm just telling you, there's, there's some people that are gifted different ways. If you need someone to cook a meal for you, you're not calling me. I'm just saying, that's like not the person. There's people on the band, you know, that are awesome musically, but you're not calling them to like, Fix your car. I was trying to think of a nice thing to say. <laughs> Everybody has their gifts. Nehemiah was not gifted to build. But God said and revealed to him the brokenness of a wall. And he said, Lord, my answer is yes. And he took his brokenness into the presence of God that turned into burden. The burden turned into action. He went and led the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And you know what God brought to him? God brought builders to come alongside him. 
We'll talk about it in coming weeks. God brought people that were skilled and gifted in the area he was burdened in so that he could accomplish the task. So stop disqualifying yourself because you don't think you're skilled in the area you're burdened for. Just step out in faith and see what God does. Have a yes in your spirit that says, God, whatever you want to do, I'm here. Lord, send me. I'm looking for a church of people, of men and women of God that say, Lord, send me. I don't care what's happening around me. I'm burdened for the walls that are broken, and we're not settled for anything less than city transformation. So, Lord, if you want to use someone, use me. Use me. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. It's interesting. Jesus is showing up to Jerusalem. He's on his way to be crucified. He's showing up to Jerusalem, the city of God, the same city that Nehemiah felt burdened to rebuild. Now Jesus is walking up on Jerusalem, and it says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. Do you remember what we read? Nehemiah, when he heard the condition of the people, he wept. Now Jesus, when he saw the city, he wept. Nehemiah rebuilt walls. He cried over broken walls. He wept over broken walls. Jesus came, and he wept over broken humanity. Jesus marched in Jerusalem. Marching the city, knowing what was coming, and he laid down his life. He died a cruel death, not so we could have a story in the book, but because each and every one of us needed to be rebuilt. Everyone is broken. This is what the Bible says for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody's broken. And he says, I'm going to come and rebuild what life has broken down. I am going to give forgiveness to past, present, and future sins. I'm going to cleanse you and forgive you. My Bible says whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Jesus marched into Jerusalem in response to a burden. He didn't just say like, oh, here I am, here to be crucified. He came with a burden. He saw the people, broken humanity, broken walls, broken cities, broken people, and he wept. I'm going to tell you this. There are some things that matter to you that don't matter to me. And there's things that matter to me that don't matter to you. But God put those things in your heart for a reason. And those things that matter to you are not supposed to sit back and think about and get bitter because the church isn't doing them. You are a part of the solution. So you've got to step out in faith and say, God, if you put it on my heart, if this thing bothers me, then you must be calling me to build. We have to get rid of excuses. You know how many times people come to me and pay hey, pastor, I got an incredible discipleship idea. If you would just give the next 37 years of your life to do these things, and, and, and I'm saying, did God give that to you? I, I appreciate you putting that on me, but God gave it to you. So run with it. Carry the burden of the Lord. Carry the burden of the Lord. Let it move you to action. Are you broken for single moms? Then develop a burden and find action. Are you passionate for marriages? Are you passionate for family? Don't come tell me. Begin to develop a burden. I care, but God can do something about it. If you would begin to step out in faith, God would begin to give you innovative ideas and wisdom and strategy. I was, I was, I was playing golf last week. Well, I shouldn't say I was playing golf. I was attempting to play golf last week. Got to be honest in the house of God. Spent more time looking for my golf ball than playing. But I was having a conversation with a guy, and he said, I, I, I sold my last business, and I started another business with three other guys, and our, our, our express purpose is to fund the kingdom. He said, I was comfortable, and I was, I, I, I was doing just fine. I could have lived forever there doing what I was doing, barely working. He said, but I was provoked in my spirit because of the brokenness of humanity, and I realized I had a unique skill set to be able to develop wealth and, and, and to be able to contribute to the kingdom of God. So he sold this business, started a business with two other partners that were kingdom-minded, and everything that they're making, they are funneling into the kingdom of God. You know what that is? That's a burden that's been developed, and now they've said yes to. Most churches are full of burdened people, but also immobile people. God has not called us to be an immobile church that's heavy but doesn't do anything. No, we're, we're, we're called to make a difference. 
We're called to be on the front lines of what God is doing. We're called to make a difference wherever we go. We were born, listen to this, you were born to build. God put it in you. He wired in your DNA. You were born to build. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, being confident of this, that he who began, the one who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If God started it, he will finish it. I had a good friend who went through a really difficult time, and he started saying this phrase all the time over and over, started posting everywhere. He says, if it's not good yet, God's not done yet. It's not okay just to be burdened. Well, at least we have a nice little safe church, and I know the rest of the world's crazy, but at least we're nice and safe in here. What? If there's broken walls, then we should have burden. We should care about what's happened in our world, what's happened in our city. And the reason we care is not so that we can grow bitter and say, look how bad it is. The reason we care is so that we can become burdened and say, yeah, young people, hear me. God needs you right now. The, Bible, the, the, the our statistics are saying that your generation is the most biblically illiterate generation in the history of Christianity. What? The statisticians are saying that this generation is leaving the church, Gen Z, is leaving the church at an alarming rate. Can I tell you something? To me, that's not a reason for us to huddle in the church and say, oh, this is so sad. To me, that's a reason to get burdened and say, okay, we've got to get to work. And you've already seen it. We're upping all of our student ministries. We're upping our leadership college. Everything that's, that ministers to the next generation, we're pouring resource into, strategy into, because we have a burden for the next generation that they would serve God and love God. And even after I'm gone, there's going to be generation of young people that still steward the fire of their heart. Friends, we've got to get a burden again. If our burden is us, if our only burden is me, we have missed the mandate of the gospel. The burden is not in here. The burden is out there. Isaiah 61, most people know this passage of scripture, but a lot of times when you read this passage, you don't read the, the last verse. And I want to read you this passage. It says Isaiah, in Isaiah 61, verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. It's God's anointing is on you to rebuild. Because the Lord has anointed you to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent you to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now check out verse 4. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Friends, that's the call of the church. That's the, that every place that's been ruined, that's been devastated, that's been in disrepair, that God would raise up men and women in his church that say, I'm supposed to rebuild. I'm supposed to rebuild that place. I'm supposed to rebuild that relationship. I'm supposed to rebuild in that area. Friends, if you carry the burden of God, this is where true fulfillment comes from. You will never be completely satisfied until you're completely walking in the plan and the purpose that God has for you. You can be working as a cupbearer. You can be working as a waiter, a waitress. You can be working as a plumber, a mechanic, an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter the occupation as long as you're following the burden of the Lord. And if you follow his burden, this is how we rebuild. I've got a burden. I've got a burden for our city that we wouldn't just be a church in the city. I've got a burden for our city that people would know that if they need healing, they can come here. I've got a burden for our city that they would know if they need breakthrough, they can come here. I've got a burden for our city that if their kids are running off and being rebellious and great, they can come here. I, I have a burden for our city, for these communities that we're in that we wouldn't just be a little Christian outpost, 
but we would be an army of builders that carry the burden of the Lord, that our businesses would be about rebuilding, that our ideas would be about rebuilding, that our ministries would be about rebuilding, that we could see places that have been devastated for generations rebuilt. There's a story of the Welsh revival that literally revival was sweeping Wales and entire soccer stadiums were empty. Games were being played and fans were not in there because they were, people were in church. That is, people were walking down the street and t- taverns or bars were completely empty because people were in services, in church. And you know, what, what's interesting is we read those stories and we recount old revivals or old moves of God and we're like, wow, that was amazing. But nobody has the audacity or the faith to believe that God could do it again. The Bible says, can a nation be saved in a day? Can it? Or do we just get our Christians together and just huddle up and do the best we can? No, I want to carry the burden of the Lord that looks out from this place and says, God, do what only you can do. What if all over DFW, restaurants were empty, stadiums were empty, and people were in houses of God lifting up worship, carrying a burden for mankind, for humanity, carrying a burden for their neighbor, carrying a a burden for the business world, carrying a burden for young couples and family, carrying the burden. Me and Pastor Keon were talking on the way to Frisco, and he said, man, it's so good, but I, I think, like, the purpose of God is so big sometimes that it's like, yeah, I want to do that, but, like, where do I start? i got to go to work tomorrow. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm fired up, Pastor. I'm going to rebuild the city. I don't know what one. I don't know what I'm going to do, but, man, I'm, I'm with you. I think we can find it in the text we read in verse 5. Of chapter 2 of Nehemiah says, I answered the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me. Let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. There's two things that will usher you into the beginning of carrying your burden, stepping into your purpose. One is just the declaration before God, Lord, send me. And then two, is recognizing that you are a part of the solution. I just was preaching a youth conference in Southern California and um, this weekend, and I, they're still asking me to speak at youth conferences. I'm like, I'm starting to get old. I was like looking at these kids like, wow, I don't know, I don't know. So I'm preaching, something I always tell young people is you're oftentimes the answer to your own prayer. Lord, please save my school. Yep, you're there, bro. You are the answer to your own, you're supposed to be alive. I wish, God, you would just save my dad. Well, you got to take what happens on Wednesday night when your hands are up and you're shrieking and dancing and worshiping. You got to take that thing home and let the fruit of the Spirit show in your house. Because you're the answer to your own prayer. Can I just say it this way? In the context of what we've been talking about, you're the answer to your own burden. And the answer to your own burden starts with these words, send me. And this is my challenge this morning. I feel so stirred in my spirit. This is my challenge is that we as a body would not just look to someone and say, Lord, send them. But we would say, Lord, send me. Send me. How do I start this grand purpose of God? How do I begin to rebuild the city? Just start with a simple prayer. Lord, send me. If you've got a ruined city or if you've got a wall that's decimated or people that are broken, God, I'm your guy. If you're going to send somebody, send me. If you're going to send someone, Lord, send me. If you're going to use somebody, use me. If you need someone to speak for you, I'll speak for you. If you need someone to go for you, I'll go for you. Whatever you need, God, my answer is yes. You can send me.